Today, we will talk about Israel Keyes, the most brutal murderer of all time. After serving in the U.S. Army from 1998 to 2001, Israel Keyes is believed to have spent a decade traveling around the country. For 10 years, he robbed banks, kidnapped, raped, and brutally murdered innocent victims. Keyes made himself murder kits with guns, ropes, and other items in hiding places, picking them up before kidnapping another innocent soul. He would use the kits to kill his chosen victim and then disappear from the scene of the crime. This is the defunct City Channel. Subscribe to our channel and don't forget to click on the bell not to miss new episodes and stay informed. Keyes was born on the 7th of January 1900 in Richmond, Utah in the United States to a family of Mormons who preferred to homeschool their children. When the family moved to Stevens County, they attended a church called Ark, which was known for its racist and anti-Semitic views. After a few years, the father would decide to give up religion entirely and declare himself an atheist. But at that time, the Keyes family was still friends and lived next door to the Kivo family. Israel himself was friends with Chevy and Chena Kivo, notorious racists who were later accused of murder and attempted murder. At the age of 20, Keyes joined the U.S. Army. He served at Fort Lewis and Fort Hood and in Egypt until he was discharged from the service with a perfect record in 2001. Keyes' life of crime, however, began before he joined the Army. He himself confessed to raping a very young girl in Oregon. About 1,996 to 98, when he himself was 18 to 20 years old, he told FBI agents that he had managed to get the girl away from her friends and rape her, but that he had not killed her. Thus began a long list of crimes, including robbery and theft, that the FBI is now trying to piece together into the formative stages of Key's criminal career. In the year 2007, Keyes established Keyes Construction in Alaska and began working as a construction contractor. It was from this base in Alaska that Keyes traveled to virtually every corner of the United States where he planned and committed his crimes. Since 2004, he had traveled extensively across the country, scouting out victims and burying gruesome murder kits, money, guns, ropes, and other equipment that might come in handy for killing and then disposing of the body. He admitted to the FBI that the money for his trips came not from construction work, but from funds he was able to obtain during a bank robbery. Investigators do not know exactly how many banks he may have robbed during his travels around the country. It is also unknown at what point Keyes moved on to commit the murders of random victims. Detectives suspect that it all began 11 years before his arrest. Shortly after his military service ended, there are at least 11 victims of the dodgy serial killer. On March 16, 2012, he was arrested in Texas after using a bank card belonging to an 18-year-old girl, Samantha Connick, whom he killed in February. In the months that followed, while awaiting trial for the girl's murder, Keyes confessed to several more bloody crimes during 40 hours of interrogation with FBI agents. The day of the 1st of February 2012 began like any other workday for 18-year-old Samantha Connick. But unfortunately, it ended in a terrible tragedy. As the girl was finishing her shift at the small Common Grounds coffee shop in downtown Anchorage, Alaska, a man in a ski mask approached Samantha, who was performing barista duties, and ordered coffee. Later it would become known that the man who approached the girl was Israel Keyes. After the girl brought the coffee he had ordered, the visitor suddenly drew his weapon and demanded to see his money. Samantha obediently complied with his demands. Despite this, he jumped over the bar, Keyes tied the girl's hands with zip ties, and then shoved her into his white Ford Focus car. Samantha tried to escape her captor, but was unsuccessful. In response to the girl's unsuccessful escape attempt, the perpetrator put a gun to her head and threatened to kill her if she tried again. As Keyes, with Samantha still tied up, drove through town, he told her it was just a kidnapping for ransom. If she behaved obediently, 
she would return to her family unharmed. This was a lie. Keyes kept Samantha alive for several more gruesome hours while he drove back to her coffee shop himself to pick up her cell phone and send a fake message to her boyfriend, who was supposed to pick up the girl after his shift. The message sent by the kidnapper read, Hi, I'm spending a couple of days with friends. Tell that to my dad. Keyes took the girl to his house, where he tied her up in the barn and turned up the radio so no one could hear her screams. Keyes raped Samantha and then he demanded that the girl tell him her address and drove to her house to get the bank card from her boyfriend's car. A seemingly happy coincidence leads to Keyes confronting Samantha's boyfriend, who was already flustered after learning that the girl wasn't at work when he arrived to meet her, and after receiving a strange text message from her number that Keyes had actually written. However, the guy decided it was just a common burglar who tried to break into his car. Next, Keyes returned to Samantha, killed her and left her body in the barn. He then traveled to New Orleans, where he and his family went on a pre-booked two-week cruise on the Gulf of Mexico. Upon his return to Anchorage on February 17, 2012, Keyes began preparing a ransom note. But first he decided to remove Samantha's body from the freezer. He applied makeup to the girl's frozen face, used a fishing iron to fix her eyes open to make Samantha look still alive, and took pictures of the poor girl with a fresh edition of the daily paper, as if to confirm that she was still alive. On February 17th, Keyes attached to the photograph a printed note demanding a ransom of $30,000. The note and the photograph were left by the killer in a park under a wanted notice for a missing dog named Albert and then he used Samantha's phone to text her boyfriend and tell him where to look for the ransom note. Days later, Keyes drove to Lake Matanuska, where he dismembered the unfortunate girl's body, punched a hole in the ice, and dumped the remains into the lake. Frank Russo, the police detective who conducted the interrogation, he says, drilled a hole and went winter fishing on the lake. He tied parts of the girl's body with wire and tied a weight to them. Then he let part of her body go under the water while continuing to fish. I remember asking him if you caught a fish, and he said yes, I did. I asked him what did you do with it. Well, I took it home, and I ate it, he said. It was just a nauseating confession to me, the detective recalls. In the meantime, Samantha's dad, James Koenig, believing his daughter was still alive after receiving the stage photo, deposited the money which was raised through the generosity and participation of local residents who couldn't stay away from the case. However, Keyes made the big mistake of instructing the girl's family to move the ransom for her to her own account. An ATM camera managed to take a picture of the kidnapper's car, and that is how the police were able to figure out that the suspect drove a white Ford Focus. Thanks to this information, Keyes was soon pulled over for a routine vehicle check, and in the car police found paint-covered bills from the man's bank robbery, a ski mask, and a gun. In addition, police found Samantha's phone and bank card. Keyes was immediately arrested. He was extradited from Texas to Alaska, initially on bank card fraud charges. On the 2nd of April 2012, investigators found Koenig's body in a lake, and on the 18th, a grand jury indicted Keyes for the kidnapping and murder of Samantha. Police detective Jeff Bell and FBI Special Agent Jolene Geaton questioned Keyes for more than 40 hours. Although he was not too eager to give away details of his crimes, he began to confess to some of the murders he had committed over the past 11 years. After his arrest, Keyes confessed to kidnapping Samantha from a coffee shop. He also provided the police with many more details of the crime, but before he did, he made them agree to one condition of his. All details were to be kept from the press. The reason he didn't want his young daughter to read about what he had done to Samantha. I'll give all the minute details of the crime if you want me to. I have many more stories to tell you, he said. Soon the investigators finally realized that they were dealing not just with a murderer, but with one of the most cold-blooded, most methodical serial killers of all time. It quickly became clear that in addition to Samantha Koenig, Keyes had killed before. 
The first murder, according to Key's confession to police, occurred in Washington State in the late 90s. The man told authorities that he had killed at least seven people in various parts of the country, although it is believed that Keyes may have taken the lives of 11 people in all. In addition to Samantha Koenig, police were able to name two other victims of the Vermont couple, Bill and Lorraine Carrier, previously reported missing. Keyes allegedly broke into the couple's home on the night of June 8, 2011. He himself described his attack on the couple as a rushing attack. He cut their telephone wires before breaking into the house with a flashlight. He managed to tie up his victims and take them to an abandoned farmhouse. He shot Bill in the basement and then raped and strangled Lorraine. Their bodies were never found. T.J. Donovan, the Chittenden County District Attorney, stated that the couple is from Vermont. The facts demonstrate that in the face of death, Bill and Lorraine showed extraordinary courage and great affection for each other. They fought to the end. Keyes later admits that two years before the couple's death, he had assembled a murder kit containing a gun, silencer, cartridge, and garbage bags. The killer hid the kit near the couple's home and later used it to kill Lorraine and Bill. In all, Keyes confessed to killing four people in three different incidents in Washington State. He did not name names although he probably knew them because he liked to follow the news of his atrocities on the internet when he returned to Alaska. He also killed a man on the east coast of the United States. Keyes buried the body in New York, but killed his victim in another state. He did not provide investigators with more details on these cases. Jeff Bell believes that Keyes provided them with details about the carrier couple's murders because he knew they already had evidence pointing to him. That's why he gave more details about those murders than he did about the others. Bell believes the interrogations were the first time the killer had ever talked about his crimes and what he himself called a double life. He believes Keyes covered up the details of the other murders because he didn't want his family to know anything about his secret life of crime. Keyes planned the murders in advance and took extraordinary precautions not to be caught. Unlike most serial killers, which made tracking his crime much more difficult, Keyes had no specific victim type and killed both men and women, but assured that children and parents were untouchable to him. When asked why he chose his victims, Keyes said I didn't just pick at random. Frank Russo recalls I remember asking him why he went into that particular coffee shop that fateful day, and he simply replied, well, it was open late. The perpetrator acted away from home and never committed a second crime in the same place. On his trips, he paid only in cash and turned off his cell phone. In addition, he did not have the slightest connection to his victims. As soon as his choice fell on the next victim, he would bury the murder kit in the right area. As he did in the case of Bill and Lauren's murders, his kits found in Alaska and New York. But he admitted that there were prepared others in Washington, Wyoming, Texas, and possibly Arizona. Keyes admitted that he admired another serial killer, Ted Bundy, stating to investigators that he saw himself in a well-known murderer. However, he called another killer Dennis Rader, or, as he was called, a weakling for openly admitting that he repented of the crimes he had committed. Monica Dole, a homicide investigator from Anchorage, said of Keyes, he didn't kidnap and kill people because he was crazy. He didn't kidnap and kill people because his deity ordered him to or because he had a bad childhood. Israel did this because it brought him great satisfaction. Almost like an addict gets great satisfaction by taking drugs. In a way, he was addicted, and he depended on the feeling he felt when killing. When asked by investigators why he committed all these crimes, Keyes simply answered why not. In the end, the investigators realized that Key's motive was very simple. He killed because he liked it. He enjoyed it. He liked what he was doing, Gordon adds. He was talking about the adrenaline, the excitement he felt at the same time. Keyes himself said, I am two different people, in fact. The criminal admitted that he has been leading a double life for a long time. From the age of 14, I knew that there were things that seemed perfectly normal to me. 
but that no one else considered normal. So investigators began to guess that he had been a serial killer for many years. However, when Keyes committed his very first crime remains a mystery to this day. It is interesting to note, however, that when Israel was only 18 years old, a girl who was later found murdered disappeared from the place where he lived. Julie Maria Harris was 12 years old when she disappeared on March 3 of the year 1996. The girl was a participant in the so-called Special Olympics. Both of the teenager's feet were replaced by prosthetic limbs. Julia disappeared from the Colville area when she went to church. The girl vanished without a trace. Only some time later, her prosthetic feet were found at the mouth of the Colville River. A year later, part of her skeleton was discovered. Special Agent Ted Hulla notes that investigators asked Israel about Julie and her death. He said he knew about it, but was not involved in the crime. In addition, he stated that the birth of his daughter convinced him of the importance of giving up child hunting. Although this was probably true. The daughter was born much later than Julie Harris's murder. One of the missing girl's friends said she remembered Julie talking to Keys by the pool, where she often swam. Even more, a witness claimed Julie allegedly gave him her address and phone number. Despite the intrigue surrounding death, Julie Harris claims that he first committed the first attempted murder in 1997 or 98 when he kidnapped and abused a young Oregon Bend girl. Keyes said it was strange, she was scared, but just talking, just about little things. I don't know. It was weird. I was sure I messed up that time in Oregon because, you know, I let her go. Israel never let any of her victims go again. On December 2, 2012, while Keyes was in prison in Anchorage, he committed suicide. Beneath his body was found an incoherent letter, which was later described as a gruesome ode to murder. The note contained no clues to help identify his other victims. The letter simply described them as adorable, captive butterflies. In another fragment of the message, your face was written as a portrait framed by dark curls. The rays of the sun seeped through the reflections of red. I wondered what color and how straight they would become licked back by the sweat of your blood. On the 10th of December, 2012, Keese's mother Heidi and his four sisters attended a modest funeral service in Washington Durr Park. Pastor Jay Garner began the service with the words, He is not in a better place. He is together in eternal torment. Only now has the FBI decided to share with the public the drawings Keyes drew in his own blood, which were found in his cell after his suicide. In a desperate attempt to establish with the help of the public and other victims of the perpetrator, FBI agents have revealed gruesome drawings which they believe indicate that the victims were actually 11. These skulls are drawn in blood, and they were found under his bed in his prison cell. One of the drawings says we are one. Israel Keyes is the epitome of the worst serial killers of the 21st century, and he came closest to the image of the monster from the horror movie of all known criminals. Had he not relaxed and killed Samantha Connick in her hometown on that ill-fated day, the police, as they themselves admit, probably never would have been able to capture him.